So gentlemen, thank you very much for, for joining us. We have a huge task, which is actually trying to piece all these together <laughs> and, and, and make yeah, the last half an hour very interesting before maybe we actually will part a nice dinner all together. So, so maybe my, my, my first question here, uh, I believe is for, is for uh, Philip, if I'm not wrong. Uh, it would be looking at specifically the question of data itself. So if we want to have the right technology implemented here in, 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 uh, in Saudi Arabia, if you want to have the, 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 the correct understanding of what will be needed in the sector, if we want to have the right geological survey and others, we need to have the right data collected. And I think you know, it'd be very interesting to see what you can bring here to the, to the conversation in terms of how to better have a better knowledge uh, that, that can be offered in, in the mining sector of having you know, reliability of data, data archiving, into the geological survey here in Saudi Arabia, to which you actually contributed from the collaboration with Finland and Saudi Arabia. Please take it away from here. Oh yeah, thank you very much. Um, we've been discussing this just with a, with a lot of other colleagues. Um, if you look at the uh, results of the Fraser Institute that are regularly published, and particularly uh, on countries that are able to attract international investment, Finland has been sticking out as the number one country for the last five or six, not e if not even 10 years. So the issue is that if you have geological data, first of all, you have to, of course, ensure that you have very good geological data. You have to maintain the geological data, and as you have already mentioned, you have to archive it. But the main secret is then also not to just to have the data and to have a nice database, but how are you actually going to attract investment to the mining sector? So the data should be for free. And this is what, um, I mean, the service that, that we provide in Finland is that you can virtually start your exploration from your desktop at home. You don't even have to travel to the country. And it's all for free. Only if you want then very specific, very detailed data sets, there's a certain cost attached to it, which is basically because then we have to go and give you all the specific data. But th th then the, the other issues I've mentioned already, the data quality. So it's not enough to just put some whatever geological data in there. So you need, I wouldn't promote a geological survey, it could be whatever institution that has the expertise to oversee and to ensure that the data is of good quality. And that can also, in the case that investors come, guide the mining companies that what does this geological data actually mean? And where would you then have to actually target your exploration? You would need very much geophysics for that. Um, and that will then uh, generate um, a trust, of course, in the mining sector and in, in the data, and that will then lead to an influx, at least that's what we see in Finland, of um, investment into exploration. The last thing is this data archiving, and this is why I promote in, in a certain way that is it worthwhile to give this to a, public, uh, to, to a private company, or would you rather do that on a public uh, space so that you have the insurance that this data will definitely be managed over a very, very long time horizon. Thank you. No, perfect. To, to just build on this and maybe turn to you, Amar. Yeah. We talk about generating transparent data, but then we have to be able to use it and use it locally. And Absolutely. One of the things that the Kingdom has done very well is to rely on international collaborations, on best practices internationally to start building and starting the sector. But then you need to make sure that you actually have the right manpower the right institutions, academic institutions here to be able to build sustainably the sector itself. Could you actually maybe share with us some of your thoughts about how to build this technological business academic ecosystem to have you know strong and sustainable absolutely here? absolutely. As you see, Alita Mining Company has been is a company is a local company that is uh, already uh, carrying more than 200 uh, Saudi employees uh, over the 800 and is able uh, with more than uh, 60 geologists uh, and is able to uh, has been able uh, in the years uh, under the leadership of our founders uh, Mr. Khaled Jedali and the CEO to build up uh, the local content in terms of uh, partnerships with institutions and in institutions with university uh, King Saud University between the others uh, and uh, to uh, to enhance uh, the local requirement Local requirement nowadays is not uh, can be answered why needed. The answers may be easy because the Saudi Vision 2030 requires. But actually, the Saudi Vision 2030 it has been uh, uh, ahead of times. 
because with the uh, new world that all of us we are uh, living after the pandemic and, uh, and the shortage of worldwide manpower that is skilled and unskilled even, that is in, the, in, the key, in the most of the key countries, it is an essential requirement nowadays. Mm -hmm. And therefore, a local qualified uh, contractors with local qualified manpower is essential. Nowadays, uh, the difficulties would be, maybe this is the next point, is how to uh, enhance the uh, qualified the local manpower. Uh, Saudi Arabia beating the world champions, Argentina is the best example uh, that the Saudi, Saudi young, uh, talented, can make any, war, any job in the world. Need to be motivated. I was in a panel, I was uh, hearing a panel before, they were speaking about uh, mining sectors, uh, very, very willing to go, it was very, very intelligent point, uh, that they were willing to go to electrical cars to move stuff. Uh, and, uh, and the expert was saying, so why you need to move people? So you need to go to remote works. So that's uh, all the ways that need to be studied in order to let uh, the Saudi to come inside of uh, mining sectors that is famous to be a very hard uh, works. Mm -hmm. And so that is the ways how to cooperate again with institutions, with the government, but also with the, with the miners, how to build up this, uh, this activity. And still on this idea of, of, of local skills and, and building the local workforce, and maybe turning to, to, to James, I mean, we're seeing here a very ambitious roadmap through the different, you know, Vision 2030 and, and the desire to, to go from, you know, first steps of the mining sector towards very quickly, very ambitious uh, objectives in the mining sector. You've been working in several jurisdictions around the world. Uh, could you maybe give us some examples of, of countries where you know, you've seen this same you know, process of building local skills, of building local institutions, some key lessons learned from those, an example that could be uh, blueprints for, for Saudi Arabia to continue the, the journey? Um, <coughs> yes, thanks. Um, look, it's, 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 I spent some a bit of time in the main session today, and it was very exciting to hear uh, all the, the, the plans, I mean, not, not on a global basis, in terms of how much um, mining activity needs to happen. I mean, if you think about copper and nickel, and cobalt, etc. But f for us as a mining services industry, it is also quite, makes us quite nervous, because um, uh, if there's one major growth inhibitor for all of us, it's, it's skills. We, we are in a skills crisis globally, whether we like it or not. This industry is in a skills crisis. There's a, it, it's translated into a huge, what we call a war for talent. So to get good people, uh, to go to the right places, uh, to take on these jobs is, is, um, is costing us more every day. And, and our biggest, uh, one of our biggest challenges is getting young people to enter this industry. It is not the most, traditionally not the most attractive industry to join. So this is our, this is our challenge. And, and it's not a quick one, and it's not an easy one to fix. I would like to, to believe, you know, listening to some of that previous session, that you know, we'll, 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 we'll become autonomous one day and be able to send robots underground to pick out the bits of metal, as we were talking about. But let's be, let's be realistic. That is, that is many years away. And, and if you just look at, we've been on journeys ourselves um, as a group in terms of trying to, to automate and and digitize a bit more, but, but we're only at a phase now where we can maybe do some remote monitoring. We are, we are not even close to proper automation. And I think we're many, many years away from that. So, so the skills crisis is on us, we have to solve it. Um, and we have to get a bit creative about how we solve that because um, it's, it's not a simple one. And, and what makes it particularly difficult in a region like this, which is, which is rapidly growing um, in a very short space of time, is it doesn't have that you know, in other, other jurisdictions we've been lucky, we've had tens of or de decades of skills base that's been developed, whereas here we have to build it really quickly. So you've got to be creative. So in terms of what can we do, I think, I think there's, no, uh, there's no way of getting around it. We have to invest. And I think there's three levels that we have to invest on. Um, the first one, and always an important one, is the formal sector. So mm -hmm. universities, technical colleges, um, getting the right skills into the industry, and, and we as, an, as industry players need to partner with those institutions. And we need to invest with them in graduate programs, work with them, and, and, and we're at fault in some way of not working closely enough with those institutions to, 
to um, they are they are great sources of of innovation and knowledge and and research. Uh, working with them, uh, putting money back into those programs to get the graduates out that we're looking for. So that's the first one, very important one. But on its own, I don't think it solves the problem, because um, the biggest gap that we see is is the divide between a, a graduate coming out of a, a technical college or university and that person being practically ready to operate a plant or, or operate a mining operation. And, and let's be honest, I mean, we aren't, when we talk about the skills crisis, it is not just at a very senior engineering type of level. We've got skills crisis going right through our organization. So, um, and I'll give you one example now, and, with, with, with everyone moving to underground mining, and particularly mechanized underground mining, we have a huge skills crisis in just finding operators of mechanized machines underground. Um, and that's a global problem. So that, the, the practical side of how do we take people that have the basic skills and get them to be practically ready, um, we need to go back to basics there. We need to, on the job training, reinvest in that. The training centers we used to have, we need to reinvest in those, and, and regions like Saudi Arabia need to, to build out those with, with us as mining service providers in terms of training centers for the future, getting those practical skills into the workforce. And yes, it takes time, but we've got to find ways to make that quick, uh, more rapid. The third part, which we've actually realized now, we've underinvested in for many years, is, is, is investing into your people that you have, the great people that you have, to keep them in the industry and give them a career path that can say, listen, you can, you can get to where you want to be 20, 30, 40 years in the, in, in the mining industry. It's a great place to be. Uh, it's moving forward. It's modern. It can give you anything in a career. Because the, the worst thing that can happen to us is we create great graduates, we train them practically, and then we lose them to other industries. So, so we've had to rethink that and how we reinvest in uh, keeping our people mm -hmm. and giving them that career path, that mentoring, that coaching. It's invaluable and, uh, and difficult to put a price on. And then my final thought on it is, in a crisis like this, you're not going to solve it with just doing the same things you, over and over again. You've got to get a bit innovative. So digital and technology is going to play a role here. It's not, it's not the silver bullet, I don't think, but you know, we have to harness the technologies we can, whether that's remote learning, uh, remote interactions between people, um, uh, what, whatever the, the tools that we can bring to bear on the skills crisis, we've got to unlock those. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we have to be a bit innovative. And I think, let's, let's be honest, um, in this industry, we've relied on, on uh, uh, experts with 20, 30, 40 years experience, um, but you cannot create those overnight. You know, if you've got a five-year problem, you're not going to create a 30-year expert. So how do you, and what we're playing around with now is how do you take those old gray-haired experts, putting them with these young, dynamic, digitally kind of ready, uh, digitally hungry uh, people uh, that are coming out of the graduate programs and finding a, a winning partnership between those two skill sets mm -hmm. that really cuts down your time. So I think a lot, to, a lot to think about, a lot to play with, but it's going to take investment and it's going to take innovation. No, I, I find what you're saying very, very interesting because you're making the point of the complexity and comprehensiveness of the question of inclusion of technology in a sector like mining. It's not only about you know, shining new technologies and innovation, it's actually about being able to implement it with a variety of actors, variety of, of approach, whether it's with, with institutions such as you know, academic institutions, but also training the workforce, making sure that you have a human resources policies to maintain those skills. And, and, and what, what we have in, in mining is a very complex and comprehensive sector that has the capacity to really move forward in the country, but also needs to actually work with a series of different actors. And maybe just turning to, 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 to you, Philip, uh, w when we're looking at the different stakeholders at play here, the role of different authorities, whether it is on the licensing front, whether it is on, on the policy makings from, from, from the government, of the different actors that are involved into, uh, into the mining sectors, companies, uh, workers, and so on, you know, how do you see the interplay of those different authorities and different stakeholders? And maybe specifically because you know, Finland is known for its transparency and, uh, and, and its rule of law, and it's, uh, it's a good ecosystem to, to a sustainable develop a business. Where do you see the, the, the role of transparency in all those different uh, methods and, and processes for the development of a sector? 
Sure, and thank you very much, Remy, for the question. First, I want to reflect to what James has said, because I remember when I was studying geosciences, which is, of course, quite some time ago now, uh, there was a lot of unemployment sure. among geologists and geoscientists. So a common joke was, what does a geology student say to a PhD geologist? And he would say, I'd have a Big Mac menu, please, because the geologist wouldn't find any other employment than in McDonald's. <laughs> And this is completely different now. So we also have to think in these cycles. And what we've been seeing right now in Finland, if I remember the numbers correctly, is that we have a record applicants for studying geology. So more people than ever are actually interested because we've been also broadcasting this a lot, that mining is important and so forth. But of course, as you have said, it takes time until these people are actually educated, trained, and they have the necessary experience. And coming back to the robots you mentioned, well, somebody has to train your robots too. Okay, you call it programming, but I mean, it is like training. It's, it's not just put a robot in a mine and it will do the job by itself. Mm -hmm. So we do have a big problem there. Mm -hmm. But coming then to your question, <coughs> how do you actually structure a mining sector? And this is something that um, is, is quite interesting, what's happening in, in Northern Europe. Um, Finland and Sweden are virtually the only countries that do serious metal mining as two countries in Europe. And we are famous, as you've said, for very, very strict regulations. But on the other hand, we see a record inflow of, of, of investment into the exploration of mining. So why so? The point is, and that is the feedback we get, and of course the other authorities I talk to, is that we've got very, very strict regulations. But they're extremely trustworthy. So everybody knows exactly how long it will take and what you will have to do. In addition to that, there's a very strong interplay of authorities, how I call it. So you know exactly which institution is under which ministry, and how do these ministries play together? So in the end, and this is also important, is that the entire permitting process, the licensing process, is transparent. Yeah. And it's absolutely transparent to everybody. So you know exactly how much time you need, you know exactly how much it costs, and you know that everybody's been played with by the same rules. Right? In addition to that, of course, you need infrastructure, which is also part of this interplay of authorities, like how do you actually reach the mining area, how do you then get you know, the material in, the material out, and so forth? Where do you have schools? I mean, all of these issues that, that, that is important. So there is an interplay, and you've been mentioning this also as well as you have, the industry has to cooperate with the research sector, and, and we, we promote this a lot and we do it a lot, but then also we talk lot to the ministries and also the ministry, the, the industry does. So the, the actors among themselves have to talk to each other. And I was very happy to also refer to the panel this morning that the environmental and social governance issues are rising more and more. Yep. Because only if we take ESG serious, and we all know what social media do, if we take these issues serious, that it will be the only pr possibility to reduce the resistance in mining. Mm -hmm. And the resistance in mining can only be functioning if those that are against mining know that, okay, we will now develop better regulations and we will implement them so that we don't have the adverse effects of mining on the environment and on the social communities around it. No, very interesting, completely agree. And maybe if you want yes. to, to, to react to this, Marzio, and, and, and look it also at the, uh, at the question of standardization. Of we've, yes. we've seen you know, very interesting technology for, from large international companies or small international companies uh, we've seen best practices from around the world that could be applied here. How do we make it applied? How do we actually standardize it? How do we actually turn from international technology to actual local companies in Saudi Arabia that will become the leader of the future technology? Can you maybe just... Uh, That's you know, an interesting question also because uh, we are n not facing only the mm, issues how to transfer the international technology to the local technology, but also is the increase on the, on the, on the demand. The mining demands, uh, the mining market is uh, increasing by, fold, uh, by times and times every year, uh, mm -hmm. and the requirements are, uh, are increasing. Uh, the examples, uh, the practical examples, uh, is international joint ventures uh, to, to come to Saudi Arabia. We have, uh, as a GCL item, we have two good uh, examples uh, with uh, two world leaders, uh, DTP Mining from France, uh, uh, that is a leader in, uh, in the mining operations uh, with more than 100 million tons uh, operated every year uh, in uh, worldwide. And uh, we have, uh, they are coming now in South, Af in Saudi Arabia with established uh, company with us. 
and uh, with the uh, other company, international company from South Africa, Scaribur, for uh, airborne surveys. Um, it is essential, as uh, James was saying, uh, it is very correct, uh, the um, digitalization and the automation is not coming from one day to the other. So. Uh, the good things of uh, Saudi Arabia is that it is a young country and uh, the generations uh, are um, very ab able to use and to accept the new, the new technology, including the government. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is essential to have cooperation between all the parties to bring this one uh, together. It's not, uh, it's not things as, uh, that will come in one day, it will take time, but uh, inter international cooperations and uh, dialogue of the industry with the government is the, is the key ways. Oh, very good. Maybe James, if you can you know, build on this, on this idea of how to you know, integrate technology in Saudi Arabia, to turn Saudi Arabia in terms of you know, indigenously developing technology through you know, facilities, whether it's lab, whether it's uh, you know, testing facilities and others. And how do you see the road forward uh, on this and, and from your experience specifically? Uh, yes. Look, um in a market, in a market which is as busy as this is right now in, in mining, um, we we as as project developers we are, we often get asked the question: How can you bring this project online mm -hmm. faster? That's the question. We cannot wait years and years and years. We've got to cut the development cycle down from ten years to three or four years. How do we do that? And, and I, my first point I made is around the, the skills crisis. That's that's the first major bottleneck. The, the second major bottleneck that I that I see or we see in our business is um, there is a shortage of global capacity on what I would call a true uh, research and development test work type of lab that you can that you can count on to give you the information that you need uh, to rapidly go into a design and a build of a new process. Um, and if there was if there was one thing I, I would think a region like this would look at uh, developing uh, is that centre of excellence of you know, we, we, I'll speak to South Africa, uh, where I grew up in the industry, we had an institution called Mintec, which, yep. which made a massive contribution to our industry there. Why did they do that? They created talent, probably some of the best metallurgical talent we ever had came out of Mintec. Uh, they did a lot of research and development, they, they came up with new technology. When you had a very complex problem, they would help you solve that. And at the end of the day, they gave you quality, reliable test work. And when I say test work, I'm not just talking assay, I'm talking you know, everything through the whole process that you would need to do a, a, a proper design. What we're seeing now is there's very few institutions around the world that can, that, that can deliver you that, and, and your waiting times are anything up to six months at some of them. So it's a major bottleneck for the industry. Um, and I think for this region uh, to unlock not only some of that, that skills crisis, some of the you know, adding to the innovation and the research development and then just giving us a much quicker pipeline in terms of um, quality test work to, just to start a design on. Mm -hmm. that's, that's an institution I would, I would invest in immediately. Well, thank you. Um, we went through a, a very complete afternoon, probably three or four panels, if I'm not wrong, 10 different individual presentations. We didn't have a lot of time to open for, for any questions. So I'm just looking around in case of there's any question from the audience to make sure that people can participate. But if not, you know, I'd like to ask you maybe for any, any concluding thoughts that would have a key idea that you would want you know, people to, to, to go home or back to their country or, or develop here in Saudi Arabia with. And maybe Philip, if I can start with you, of, of, of one concluding idea is you know, summarize what we've learned today into uh, the role of technology in the mining sector or what you'd like to share with, with the audience. Well, Discussing with the people and uh, <coughs> reflecting on this, it's, I, I think coming back to the education, what many people do not know, especially if we talk about resistance to mining, is if you can't fish it, grow it, or hunt it, you have to mine it. You have to mine it. And most people that I, that I talk to, me as a geoscientist, and then you know, they say, well, but mines destroy everything. I say, how many mobile phones do you have at home? They say, what do you ask? I say, well, where do you guess that you know, the minerals for your mobile phone come from? You've got a computer, you've got a TV, you've got whatever. So I think we have to also, from our side, educate the general public how important mining is. And I think there must be a general understanding if we want to have now 
the energy transition. We need mining. Without mining, it's not going to work. Simple, stop. And, and I think there's a big gap in information. And once we can solve this information, we will also solve, at the same time, the problem of skilled personnel, of skilled people. And we will then, of course, also get a better understanding how mining should be done, starting from data, but going over the interplay of authorities towards, hopefully, uh, a more responsible mining, and then, as was mentioned in the, in the former panel, a brighter future. Thank no, you. Perfect. I don't see any hands for the moment, so maybe Marzio, if you can yes, actually provide your you conclusion. Absolutely. Those. I think that you are very right, Philip. Uh, Education of the importance of the sustainable of mining is essential. And uh, also, it's very essential uh, to have uh, long term uh, education plans uh, because skilled the staff for, uh, from any levels, not only the PhD, but also the skilled operator, skilled uh, ge junior geologist. Are essentials uh, are essentials, and this is taking. There is a, a gap, uh, worldwide gap. Mm -hmm. This need ten times uh, need concentrations. Uh, the can the world is uh, going to uh, revolutions to the green revolutions. The green evolution as a consequence that need uh, mining. I mean more minings absolutely, and these more minings for the responsibility that we have versus the next generations is to be a responsible minings. Uh, in a sustainable way and safe way. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm looking for the last call for questions now. So then, James, you have the incredible responsibility of... of, of uh, final panel. thought. Um, look, uh, I think it's obvious, you know, you don't have to listen to many um, sessions from, from uh, today to, to not see that, we're, you know, we, there's a huge amount of opportunity in the sector right now, globally and particularly in a region like this, the ultimate limiting factor, I would believe, is people. We, we can try and get away with it with, with technology and automation. I just don't think it will come quickly enough. Uh, it's not practical. We, if we can solve the skills, skills crisis, then I think we can meet all our expectations. But that's going to take investment. It's going to take the coming together in, in partnerships between the institutions, the big mining houses and us as a mining services uh, uh, community as well to do our part. And if we all do that together, I think we, we can get there. But time is short and we're going to have to do it quickly. Well, perfect. Thank you very much for, for, for this. And I'd like to ask you to join me to thank the different panelists for this. Uh, complete thank you to you, Rami, for your presentation. Really. Thank you. Very interesting indeed.